Hey guys, Heidi Preeb here. Welcome to this channel. If you're new here, welcome back. If you're not on this channel, we talk about all things Myers-Briggs, attachment theory, just any system or model that helps us to see the world in a new, better, more helpful way. Okay, so this week we were talking about emotional intimacy and why the different insecure attachment styles really struggle with it. So it's kind of stereotyped that the avoidant attachment style is the only attachment style that deeply fears intimacy. I think that is oversimplified. I think that the avoidant attachment style is the only one that fears intimacy consciously. So what that means is that on the surface of their brains, in their thinking working memory systems, they have a fear of getting too close, okay? But that does not mean that they're the only type that unconsciously has a fear of getting close. But because this is kind of the most classic intimacy avoidant type, I'm gonna start with the avoidant and talk about why they fear emotional intimacy. So there are multiple layers to this. All right, and I'm going to kind of peel back the onion as we go through this video because there are things that they fear that are more conscious and things they fear that are less conscious for them. But the deeper we go, the more strongly it's actually likely to be impacting them because the stuff that's right at the surface of our awareness, we can deal with on a conscious level and we can form strategies around that we practice. But what's unconscious for us is often what we have more trouble changing because we process it without realizing we're processing it. So by the time that information arrives in our conscious brain, it's not direct and unmuddled in a way that I'm gonna explain as this video goes on. So layer one for the avoidant attachment style of why they fear intimacy is actually about self-regulation. So using an avoidant attachment strategy means that you over-rely on self-regulation and under-rely on co-regulation. And what that means is that you don't necessarily turn to other people to process your emotions, to help you feel better when you're struggling with something. Instead, you turn to routines, things, activities, whatever it is you can think of that can help you change your mood without having to disclose to another person what's going on with you. But this doesn't happen quite the way that it sounds like it might happen, and this is a really common misconception. So people tend to think of someone using an avoidant attachment strategy as someone using an anxious strategy who's just like white knuckling it through their need to talk to other people and connect. But because avoidantly attached people learned so long ago not to co-regulate, it doesn't actually occur to them to do that, okay? It's not like they have a feeling that arises in their mind of being upset or whatever it is and they think, mm, I could call my friend, but I'd rather not. I'd rather just be strong and get through it myself, right? That's actually more similar to how an anxious or fearful avoidant person would process a difficult emotion that they want to learn to self-regulate through. For the avoidant attachment style, they have set up their entire lives around being able to keep themselves emotionally stable without even consciously realizing that they're doing that. So you'll often see with people who have avoidant attachment styles, let's say certain routines that they're very attached to, or they'll kind of always be planning out what their next move is, what the thing they wanna do next week is. They tend to set up their lives in such a way that they are always somehow giving themselves small comforts, even though that's not what they consciously process themselves to be doing. So someone who wakes up at 5.30 a.m. every single morning and hits the gym and then meditates and then eats a healthy breakfast, what they're doing is keeping their environment controlled so that they can expect what they're going to feel over a given course of a day and they're not going to be too thrown off course. That's one possible strategy for consistent self-regulation for someone with an avoidant attachment style, right? Is making sure that they have a routine set up that means they are going to stay relatively emotionally stable even through periods of upset. Because if you know if you can predict what's gonna happen in your environment and you can predict which things you're going to do for yourself on a daily basis that are going to keep you feeling stable, centralized, and in control, that is emotional regulation right? Or on the other side of things, on this channel we talk a lot about Myers-Briggs. Let's say you have an avoidantly attached person who is a perceiver. They might always be planning their next adventure, planning the next thing they want to do, planning their next business venture. They will have something constantly in their awareness that is helping them to regulate their moods. So if they don't like what they're doing now, or if they don't like their life at the moment, they have something to look forward to that does not depend on anyone else to fulfill and that's the important part. So all of these self-regulatory strategies that someone with an avoidant attachment style will not consciously recognize they're doing serve the end goal of keeping them feeling stable. 
Now, the problem with emotional intimacy, and this is what's on that top layer of awareness for the avoidant attachment style, is that it threatens to disrupt some of their routines and self-regulatory strategies. It also threatens to disrupt their emotional equilibrium, because when you have emotional intimacy, you are, by default, kind of throwing yourself off of balance a little bit, especially if you've managed to design your entire life around self-regulating through things that do not require other people's input. If you open yourself up to emotional intimacy, emotional vulnerability, sharing your life in your inner world with other people, these perfectly crafted strategies that you have spent probably decades and decades building up if you have an avoidant attachment style are suddenly gonna seem a little bit threatened. What if someone sleeps over and now it's a little bit less convenient for you to wake up at 5.30 a.m., get that workout in, get that meditation in, get that healthy breakfast in? What if a relationship forces you to disrupt your travel plans and now you don't have that future thing to look forward to? And these self-regulatory strategies that you have honed for yourself over decades are suddenly threatened a little bit by the emergence of someone else in your world, right? Emotional intimacy naturally leads to compromises and to factoring someone into our lives because when we become truly emotionally intimate with someone else, there is a natural sense of kind of give and take that happens especially if it's a romantic relationship where it's kind of expected that you're gonna start combining your lives a little bit. So from the outside, this is why avoidance can look so uncompromising, right? It's not that they don't wanna make room for a partner, it's that they fear losing out on all of these strategies they've built their lives up around that keep them feeling stable. And this is why you rarely see the avoidant attachment style showing strong emotions, you rarely see them dysregulated, you rarely see them expressing discomfort or fear or anger because they have built their lives up in such a way that those feelings are at least on a conscious level for them, and that's important, kept at bay most of the time. So layer one of the avoidant fearing emotional intimacy is that they fear they're going to have to compromise the relationship they have with their self and their own ability to self-regulate if they were to take the time and energy and commitment that it would take to factor in someone else. But then there's layer two. Now, layer two is where we really get into the kind of unconscious wounding of the avoidant attachment style. So people who use this attachment strategy, it's important to note they did not choose this. They do not consciously know until they start doing work on their attachment style that a lot of the unconscious stuff that's happening for them that is causing them to push people away is even there because it's not right on the surface of their awareness. But most people using an avoidant attachment style tend to have some form of disgust response around emotional intimacy. Here's why. From a very young age, we're talking like under two years old, usually someone who develops an avoidant attachment style has the experience of having their vulnerability, their need, their upset, all of those kind of emotions that go into emotional intimacy being rejected by a caregiver. This could be outright, right? It could be a parent looking at their child when they're crying and going, boys don't cry, man up, you know? or it could be more subtle. So let's say we have a parent who has an avoidant attachment style themselves. They have been conditioned to fear and feel disgust around intimacy and kind of vulnerable emotions. So they subtly, probably without them even being aware of this, are less likely to respond to their child's more vulnerable emotional needs. So maybe when their child is happy and excited and showing them things, they get a lot of positive attention, but when their child is crying or sad or showing need, they're a little bit more likely to distance themselves or to kind of try to quickly shift their child's mood so that they don't have to encounter that sense of internal vulnerability that they have learned to avoid, right? Because to mirror someone else's emotion, we have to find and access that emotion inside of ourselves. And if the avoidant is afraid of accessing that emotion inside of themselves, they're going to reject it in other people. So this is how sometimes an avoidantly attached parent will raise an avoidant child. Child cries, parent shows disgust, that little baby brain starts to learn very subtly but very quickly vulnerability, need, sadness, helplessness, all of those emotions get me rejected or result in a disgust response from my parent, right? So the child becomes classically conditioned to associate feelings of vulnerability and need with disgust. And that role that their parent played in their early lives ends up becoming a little voice that lives inside of their heads. But it's important to note that this voice is unconscious. So a lot of the time, someone using an avoidant attachment strategy will feel self-disgust very instinctively, largely unconsciously, anytime they perceive their own feelings of need or vulnerability. Okay, and that's very important. So I gave this example on Twitter a while back, but I remember there was this one summer where I was 
in a new group of people. We were all living together in this kind of like co-living environment. And I have chronic pain that usually I don't tell people I have um, until like the past couple years of my life when it became apparent to me that like people have chronic pain and they talk about it. I think maybe like a handful of people in my life knew, but I got hit by this bout of chronic pain that was one of the worst bouts I've ever had. So I was basically completely out for like two weeks. All I could do was go from bathtub to bed to bathtub to bed and that was the only thing I was capable of for about 14 days. Now in this time I was in a new community of people and every once in a while when I would leave my room to go pick up delivery food that had gotten delivered to the front desk of the hotel we were staying at or whatever it was I would pass some of the people in this community and they knew that I was sick but they didn't know how sick and there was this moment every time where someone would ask me how I was doing and I would kind of panic and go oh you know I'm not feeling well but I'm definitely starting to feel better like within a couple of days I'll be back to normal and I knew I would not be back to normal in a couple of days like there was no way in hell that this was going to turn around in 48 hours so it kind of became this thing where people were always like well why isn't Heidi hanging out why is she just hold up in a room because every time I talked to people about what I was going through I was minimizing it big time and acting like things were just a little bit wrong when in reality it was excruciatingly painful for me to stand up for me to walk to the front desk and get food for me to even stand by the bath while it was running like it was bad so one day I was lying in bed and I was like I'm gonna get down to the bottom of why it is that I can't seem to let people know how sick I am and I went and slowed those moments down in my brain and I would picture someone's face asking me how I was doing and I would tune into what was going on in my body in that moment and I realized usually I would say some form of I'm not doing too well and then my body would panic because I would see kind of the subtlest change in someone's face where they were about to show concern or they were about to show pity or something like that and I would get flooded with a self-disgust response. I would hate myself for eliciting that emotion of pity or even of empathy in someone else because it was hardwired into me not to show any vulnerability or need. So the second that I felt like another person was seeing my vulnerability or need, my brain would rush in, flood me with shame, and then I would say or do anything to get them to not feel that emotion and not display that emotion towards me, right? That is classical conditioning. It's what happens when neurons wire and fire together. If your early experiences of need and vulnerability are always paired with shaming or disgust, you're going to learn to do that for yourself as you grow up. So in that situation, it became this whole thing where everyone just thought that I was super antisocial because it was so ingrained in me to feign being fine when I was not. But it wasn't that they were actively rejecting me when I was expressing vulnerability. It's that I was rejecting and shaming myself because that response was so ingrained in me. So this is a very good example of what it tends to be like for avoidantly attached people around emotional intimacy. I hear people all the time kind of giving this advice that like you just have to let an avoidantly attached person know that you won't reject them and that they're safe with you and they can open up with you. But it's not about the other person for the person who has an avoidant attachment strategy. It's self-shaming and self-rejecting that comes into play in those moments, right? So when it comes to emotional intimacy, it's not that the avoidant person is going in going, oh, I hope this person is someone who doesn't reject me when I share intimately with them. It's that the act of sharing in and of itself causes the avoidant to self-reject on an unconscious level. And all that's going to come up for them usually is that feeling of, ugh, I don't want this, but they're not really sure why or where that comes from. And often it comes up in the conscious mind as a projection. So they'll look at the other person and go, oh, you're pathetic, you're weak, why are you so vulnerable, right? Because they can't stand the idea that they have those emotions inside of themselves as well because those emotions have been classically conditioned out of their conscious awareness from the time they were extremely young. Which leads us to layer three of the avoidantly attached person's fear of intimacy, which is the feeling that there is something wrong with them that they can't quite put a finger on, but they just know if someone were to get close enough to them, they would see it. Now, this is deeply unconscious for the avoidantly attached person, as it is for every attachment style who is not secure, but every attachment style who is not secure absolutely shares this deeply held belief, just in slightly different ways. And what 
what the avoidant doesn't realize they're processing is the idea that because they have emotions, because they have needs and weaknesses and vulnerabilities, they have shame at their absolute core around that deep knowing, right? They don't realize that every single person also has those things. And that securely attached people don't have that shame at their core around the fact that they have needs and that they do need to rely on other people. We all do. So level three of intimacy fearing for the avoidantly attached person, and this is deeply unconscious, so they will not be able to tell you this. If you ask an avoidantly attached person if they feel this, unless they have been doing work on their attachment style, they're probably going to tell you absolutely not. But it is that feeling of something is wrong with me, and if anyone gets too close, they will find out. So layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of protective strategies get built on top of that fear. Right? But where that fear comes from, once again, is early rejection, whether intentional or non-intentional, on the part of their caregivers. When they showed up in the world as their needy, vulnerable baby selves and had those needs and vulnerabilities rejected, looked down on, in some cases bullied out of them by their parents, they internalized those feelings are wrong. They're bad. Those indicate something that is wrong with me. But because there's still that deep, deep somatic awareness that there's something in me that the last time I was really vulnerable got rejected, they believe growing up that any sort of intimacy is going to lead to that same sort of rejection. And the problem is we have that layer on top of it of self-disgust and self-rejection. So it's not like someone responding positively to them in moments of vulnerability is all it's going to take to reshape that. There has to be this kind of conscious and intentional process of learning to peel back the layers until they get to that core. Often that's something that it takes a really skilled therapist to help them through. A therapist who is aware of attachment theory and who understands from the get-go this person needs to start off with a more cognitive approach. They're not going to instantly be receptive to any sort of intimacy. And then we have to move very, very slowly through the process of going deeper and deeper and helping them bring up more vulnerable emotion, and then the body eventually reintegrates the idea that I can be vulnerable and have it be accepted in certain circumstances. Okay, but that is a multi-year long process. Like this takes time. And a lot of the time, I think that what avoidantly attached people really need to kickstart their healing journey is someone who is first able to really meet them on that cognitive level. So for example, earned secures are going to be your best friend here. So I kind of think of it as like someone who has really intense substance abuse issues and then gets so sober is going to feel a lot more connected to other people who have had really intense substance abuse issues and then got sober rather than people who have let's say always been sober because they just don't like using substances. Both of those people arrived in the same place which is sobriety but through two completely different routes that are pretty much night and day to each other. So finding people who have been down your route makes it easier to connect with them so someone learning to be sober is going to learn a lot more from someone who has given up substances than they are are from someone who has never used them. And in the same vein, people who are trying to move from insecure to securely attached are probably going to learn a lot more from people who have earned secure attachment by doing attachment healing work than they are through interacting with people who have always been secure because their early conditioning allowed them to be secure from the get-go. So if you have an avoidant attachment style, I think it can be very helpful to find some sort of role model, whether it is someone who has earned secure or someone who started off avoidant who is currently in the process of doing healing work around their attachment style to help you model yourself after. Because again, that trust, that respect has to be there and often avoidance respect each other. So I've noticed there can be this kind of cascade effect if let's say you have two friends or two partners, less likely for various reasons, but possible, who both share an avoidant attachment style, there's a strong sense of mutual respect there. And then one of them begins doing the healing work. The other is a lot more likely to now see the healing work as something that is respectable and not pathetic because this person who they respect and who they know is not emotionally dysregulated all over the place, which is something that the avoidant has trouble accepting, is engaging in this work and oh look, it isn't making them a giant mess all the time. So finding that sort of role model can be extremely helpful for those with an avoidant attachment style who want to start doing this work. And the reason I throw that in there is because I think it's highly likely that there are going to be a certain number of anxiously attached people watching this video going, how can I get my avoidant to open up and be comfortable and trust me? Or maybe some securely attached people. And I want to reassure you that it's probably not going to happen until they decide it's time for it to happen. Because if you meet them in this place of vulnerability and intimacy, they might even be okay with yours, depending on how you express it. But for them, there's a very different process that needs 
needs to happen for them to access those feelings inside themselves. It's a peeling back of the onion and it starts from a place of cognitive awareness. So now we're kind of veering into different territory, which is attachment healing work. And this is stuff that we will talk about in future videos. But for today, I just wanted to go over some of the reasons why avoidantly attached people fear intimacy and what's going on for them in those moments, consciously and unconsciously. So if you're watching this and you're trying to draw emotional intimacy out of an avoidant, please know you are trying to disrupt a pattern that is keeping them stable, self-regulated and secure. And if they do not consciously want to heal, it's actually not necessarily the nicest thing to do to try to disrupt those patterns because they developed those patterns because they worked for them. But if you have an avoidant attachment style and you are watching this, you're obviously already on the way to integrating a ton of cognitive information about attachment healing. And the next steps for you might be finding someone you can work with who can help you go through this process at the speed that makes sense for you. All right. That's all I have to say for today. As always, I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and I will see you back here again really soon.